The topic that we're going to take up tonight is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to teach this a little differently than I've taught this in time past. Uh, one of the realities of life is that you don't know anything. Or you, well, that's, that's true. So you don't know everything. Uh, and the things you do know, sometimes you realize, well, I didn't understand this as well as I thought I did. And so things change. You, you, you come to hopefully clearer understanding. So uh, one of the things that happens is you change the way you teach things. And some people will say, well, you're being inconsistent. And, and just the reality of life is that if you learn and grow, you're going to change your understanding about things. And hopefully you, you gain more understanding. So that's a, that's a caveat as we begin this teaching. So let me give you an overview of the four things that I want to consider. One, the definition of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. What exactly is it? Two, did Paul blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Three, did Israel blaspheme the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 7? Four, does Scripture contain any examples of people blaspheming the Holy Ghost? So let's start with number one, the definition of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So what we want to start with is we want to start by getting a very clear definition of blasphemy. I'm going to suggest that when you study Bible topics, there's three things you want to do to try to get an understanding of how the Bible uses words. The first thing is to consult a dictionary. And by that, I mean a dictionary outside the Scriptures. It's a perfectly proper thing to do. Now, sometimes Scripture will use a word differently than the dictionary, but it's a good starting point to look at the dictionary. The second thing you want to do is you want to look at near context definitions. And the idea there is to look at how the word is used in the immediate passage. And then the third thing you want to do is you want to look at far context definitions, meaning how is the word used outside of the immediate passage that you're looking at. So with that as, as a background, let's first start by looking at the dictionary definition of blasphemy. So I'm, I'm going to pull up here the Webster's 1828, and we're going to look up the word blasphemy. An indignity offered to God by words or writing, reproachful, contemptuous, or irreverent words uttered impi impiously against Jehovah. Blasphemy is an injury offered to God by denying that which is due and belonging to Him, or attributing to Him that which is not agreeable to His nature. If you look down here at point number one, that which derogates from the prerogatives of God. So the way that I'm going to summarize the blasphemy definition that we see in the 1828 is irreverent words. So they're irreverent, they're unholy, they're, they're disrespectful toward God, uttered impiously against Jehovah. So that's what blasphemy is in the scriptures or in the, in the dictionary. Now look with me at the scriptures. So get with me Luke 12, verse 10. Luke 12, verse 10. The blasphemy against the Holy Ghost passages are all in the Gospels. So we'll look to see if the near context tells us something about how the word blasphemy is used. Luke 12, verse 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Get Matthew 12, verse 31. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Verse 32, And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, 
neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So when you look at Luke chapter 12 and you look at Matthew chapter 12, it's pretty clear that blasphemy as used in the scriptures means to speak a word against. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is speaking a word against the Holy Ghost. So let's see what, let's summarize what we've seen so far. The dictionary says that blasphemy is irreverent words uttered impiously against Jehovah. The three blasphemy of the Holy Ghost passages in the Gospels give the sense of evil speaking against the Holy Ghost. So we can feel pretty good that defining blasphemy against the Holy Ghost as evil words spoken against the Holy Ghost. But what we've done so far is we've looked at the dictionary and we've looked at the near context definition. We haven't done step three, which is looking at the far context definition. Now here's why I want to emphasize this. Human nature is lazy. Human nature is lazy. So what happens is what we like to do is we like to take shortcuts. So look at the dictionary definition of blasphemy. It's irreverent words uttered impiously against Jehovah. You look at Matthew 12, you look at Luke 12. It's words uttered against, spoken against the Holy Ghost. I want to go a little bit deeper. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to pull up Blue Letter Bible, and the search that I ran there is B-L-A-S-P asterisk. So it's going to pull up every time that the word blasphemy is used in the Scriptures. You can see there that it's used 59 times in 54 verses. Now here's where human nature comes in. I don't want to read 54 verses. I mean, the dictionary told me it's irreverent words uttered impiously against Jehovah. Matthew 12, Luke 12 both define it as words spoken against God or against the Holy Ghost. So th this is not a good use of time. That's man's thinking. We're not going to go through all of them as a group. But when 1 Thessalonians says, prove all things, how do you prove all things? You got to do the homework. So let's do this together. Get Psalm 74, verse 10. Psalm 74 and verse 10. Psalm 74, verse 10. O oh God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Now, if you compare those two parts of the verse, what does the word blaspheme line up with? Reproach. It's exactly what we've seen before. Get Isaiah 37, 23. Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 23. Isaiah 37 verse 23. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? So Psalm 74, verse 10, Isaiah 37, 23, both reinforce the concept that blasphemy, blasphemy, or blaspheming, is reproach. It's evil words uttered impiously against Jehovah. Get Isaiah 65, verse 7. Isaiah 65, verse 7. Your iniquities... And the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord. Now notice this. Which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Now do you see the parallelism there? What is mountains parallel to in that verse? Hills, right? Which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Mountains is parallel with hills. 
Well, if mountains is parallel with hills, what is blasphemed parallel with? Burned incense, isn't it? Now, what you see there is that the word blaspheme in Isaiah 65, verse 7, is compared to burning incense upon the mountains. In other words, idol worship. What I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is simply this. If we stopped before we got to that verse, every indication that we saw from the dictionary, from near context, was blaspheme is to speak words against. But here we see blaspheme can be used in a broader way where it's not just speaking words, but when you engage in worship of another god, that can be considered blasphemy. Now let me show you one more verse. Ezekiel 20, verse 27. Get Ezekiel 20 and verse 27. Ezekiel 20, verse 27. Now read this one very carefully. Therefore, son of man, speak unto the house of Israel and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me, in that they have committed a trespass against me. Now that verse changes the entire discussion, doesn't it? Notice it again. Yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me. How did they do that? In that they have committed a trespass against me. Ezekiel 20 verse 27 gives you an explicit scriptural statement that committing a trespass against Jehovah is blasphemy. I'm going to read it one more time because this is important. Yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me, in that, in other words, here's the specific way they did, they have committed a trespass against me. Now what that does is Ezekiel 20, 27 makes the scriptural point that someone is guilty of blasphemy even if they aren't speaking words against if what they do is they commit a trespass against. So what have we seen so far? In Scripture, the word blasphemy includes at least three things. The first is speaking against or reproach. The second is idol worship. And the third is committing a trespass against. So now let's turn to the second point. And the second point is this. It's the question, did Paul blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Many will suggest that Paul blasphemed the Holy Ghost, but let's look at that carefully. So get Acts 26, verse 9. Acts chapter 26 and verse 9. Acts 26, 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This is Paul speaking. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death... I gave my voice against them. Verse 11, And I punished them oft in every synagogue, notice, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. In Acts 26, Paul makes the point that when he was persecuting the church, one of the things he did is he compelled them. He forced them to blaspheme. Get 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 12. 
And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So what we've seen so far from Acts 26 and 1 Timothy 1, Paul clearly compelled others to blaspheme when he was persecuting the church. And 1 Timothy 1 makes the point that Paul himself was a blasphemer. So was Paul a blasphemer? Yes. Did he blaspheme against the Holy Ghost? Because we understand that that's a specific type of blasphemy. 1 Timothy 1 doesn't necessarily say that Paul blasphemed the Holy Ghost. It says that he is a blasphemer. So I'm going to give you what I think are three reasons that Paul did not blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Get with me Matthew 12, verse 31. Matthew 12, verse 31. Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now the thing to notice there, obviously there's multiple different kinds of blasphemy. And the point being made in Matthew 12, 31 is that all manner of sin and blasphemy, I guess there's multiple varieties, can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is a specific form of blasphemy that cannot be forgiven. So was Paul a blasphemer? Yes. Is there any verse that specifically says that he committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? No, there is not. Now that's the first reason. Here's the second reason. Get with me Acts 9, verse 10. Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. Acts 9, 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. So Ananias knows all about Paul and his evil deeds because he's heard about it. Verse 14, And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Get Acts 22 verse 12. So what we saw in Acts chapter 9 is that when Paul is blinded on the road to Damascus, there's a vision given to Ananias. And Ananias is supposed to help Paul. But what Ananias says is, whoa, 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 whoa. I know all about this Saul person, and he's done much evil to the saints. Sending, him, sending me to help him is a really bad idea. I mean, Holy Spirit, th focus and think about what you're doing. Saul is a problem. This is not a good idea. Now look with me at Acts 22, verse 12. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men 
of what thou hast seen and heard. Verse 16, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, if you compare Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22, it makes a strong argument that Paul could not have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Why is that? Well, in Acts 9, did Ananias know all about Paul's evil deeds? He did. That's what the verses say. In Acts 22, what does Ananias say to Paul? He says, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Well, if Paul had committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, could Ananias say to him, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? Isn't the whole point of what the Gospels say about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost that it cannot be forgiven. Well, Paul obviously, at least in Ananias' perspective, didn't think that there was a problem with Paul being forgiven. In other words, he says, Arise and be baptized, wash away thy sins. Ananias believed that Paul could be forgiven, which means Ananias believed that he hadn't committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Now that ties into reason number three. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be forgiven, but Paul received forgiveness. Get with me Matthew 12, verse 31. Matthew 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Verse 32, And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now what some will say is, Paul committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost under the kingdom dispensation, but then God instituted a dispensational change and Paul was able to be forgiven under that new dispensation. Now in thinking about whether that's right or not, notice that verse 32 says, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Does verse 32 suggest that if the, dispensation, if the dispensation changes, that it's now possible to get forgiveness? I don't, I don't think that it does. Look with me at Mark 3, verse 29. Mark chapter 3 and verse 29. Mark 3, 29. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness but is in danger of eternal damnation. So what I would suggest to you is that when you read the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost verses in the Gospels, they make the point that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be forgiven, and it cannot be forgiven neither in this world nor the world to come, and it can never be forgiven. Taking those verses for what they say, I don't think the sin becomes forgivable just because there is a dispensational change. Look with me at 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. Now, we all know that Saul persecuted the church. That's, that's commonly understood. Notice 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So Paul obtained mercy, but if you committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, there's never forgiveness. Look at me at Colossians 1.14. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. When Paul uses the word we in Colossians 1.14, he includes himself, doesn't he? If I say we are going to get ice cream, that means I'm one of those that's going to do that. So when Paul says in Colossians 1.14, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, Paul is specifically stating that he received the forgiveness of sins. That's consistent with 1 Timothy 1 where he said that he received mercy. So if you think about blasphemy of the Holy Ghost as an unforgivable sin that hath never forgiveness, could Paul have committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? And the answer, I think, is no. I don't believe that he did. So just to tie this all together, if Paul was a blasphemer, which he was, and Paul obtained forgiveness, which he did, then the blasphemy he committed could not have been blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. It had to be a different form of blasphemy. So with regard to the second section, did Paul blaspheme the Holy Ghost? I believe the answer scripturally is no, Paul did not. What about point three? Did Israel blaspheme the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 7? Get Acts 7 verse 54. Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. When they heard these things, this is when Stephen is about to be stoned. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Verse 55 tells you that Stephen is speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost. Verse 56, And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Verse 57, Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So what's clearly going on in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is obviously full, filled with the Holy Ghost. Israel obviously rejects the testimony that Stephen is giving to them. And so what happens is Israel rejects the witness of the Holy Ghost through Stephen. And many will say, well, that act is Israel blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to suggest to you two reasons that Acts 7 is actually not blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So the first is Acts 7 indicates that Israel resisted the Holy Ghost just as they did in times past. So what am I saying? Look at verse 51. Acts 7 and verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So how often is it that Israel resists the Holy Ghost? All the time. Always is what it says there. What that means is it's possible to resist the Holy Ghost without committing blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. There's nothing in the Old Testament that mentions blasphemy against the Holy Ghost as an unforgivable sin. You only read about it in the Gospels. But Acts 7 says that in describing the fathers, they did always resist the Holy Ghost. So in other words, someone can resist the Holy Ghost and yet it not be blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Verse 52. Now, when verse 51 says, ye do always res resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. So, verse 52, in describing the resisting of the Holy Ghost by the fathers, it references them stoning the prophets. Well, what were they going to do to Stephen a few verses later? They were going to stone the prophets. That's not different than what Israel did 
in time past. The resisting of the Holy Ghost and the stoning of a prophet is not some new and unique sin for Israel. They had done it multiple times in the past. So point number one is Acts 7 indicates that Israel resisted the Holy Ghost just as they did in times past. It doesn't appear to be some sort of different type of sin. Now, the second reason that Israel did not commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 7 is that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be forgiven. But what did Stephen specifically pray in Acts chapter 7? For Israel to be forgiven. So look with me at Acts 7, verse 59. For, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go back to Matthew 12 and Mark 3, but just recall that when we were in Matthew 12 and Mark 3, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be forgiven. You, you've seen that. So look at Acts 7, verse 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, verse 60, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In verse 60, what does Stephen do? He prays for Israel to be forgiven. That's the obvious sense of what he's doing. Well, if Israel had committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, what's the point of Stephen praying for that? Because blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be forgiven. Well, let me ask you this. Does Stephen know anything about the dispensation of grace at that point in time? He can't because it's a mystery hid in God. So what's going on here? Well, some will say Stephen prayed for Israel to be forgiven, and he was just mistaken. He didn't know any better. But the problem with that, look at Acts 7.55. Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. Let me turn there really quick. Acts 7.55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost... Well, if Stephen's full of the Holy Ghost, wouldn't he have an understanding of whether or not he should pray for Israel's forgiveness? Now, some, some, another argument that people will sometimes say is, well, the Lord prayed for things in Scripture that weren't going to happen. So get Matthew 26, 39. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. So the Lord Jesus Christ, who obviously never sinned, he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, was that prayer going to be honored? It can't. The Lord Jesus Christ's death was foreordained before the world began. He had to die. So the Lord is praying for something here, but it's not going to happen. Now notice the prayer in its entirety. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thou wilt. So even when the Lord prays for something that isn't going to happen, he acknowledges that God's will needs to be done. Contrast that with 1 John 5, 16. Get 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. Now, when you think about 1 John, it's one of the Hebrew epistles. It is addressed to the period of time after the dispensation of grace ends. Let's read the verse and then... Give me an example of what the verse might be talking about. 1 John 5, 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. 
So if you, bro if you see your brother during this time, see a sin, and the sin is not unto death, can you pray and the brother be forgiven? And the answer is yes. But notice the second part of the verse. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So think with me for a moment. If you're thinking of the time period after the dispensation of grace ends, can anyone think of a sin unto death that can't be forgiven? The mark of the beast would be one, right? If someone takes the mark of the beast, can you pray about it? Can they repent? Is there any possible way to solve that problem? And the answer is no, there's not. And what 1 John 5, 16 specifically says, if what happens if you're on the earth during the 70th week and you see someone and they've taken the mark of the beast? What, what can you do? Nothing. And in fact, you shouldn't even pray about it. it it's, it's utter, there's no point to it. It is unscriptural to pray that an unforgivable sin be forgiven. Right? So therefore, let's go back to Acts chapter 7. If Scripture says there is no point in praying for an unforgivable sin, and Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost, and he prayed to is for Israel to be forgiven, what does that tell you about the sin they committed? It has to be a forgivable sin. It can't be an unforgivable sin, or Stephen would have been unscriptural and violating 1 John 5, 16 to pray for it. As we've already seen, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is unforgivable. So did Israel blaspheme against the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 7? They couldn't have. Because if they did, Stephen wouldn't have prayed, lay not this sin to their charge. So for those reasons, it seems pretty clear that Israel did not commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 7. So that leads us to the fourth point. If Paul didn't commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, which he didn't, and Israel didn't commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 7, which Israel didn't, then does Scripture contain any examples of someone committing blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So let's go to Mark 3, verse 22. Mark chapter 3, verse 22. Mark 3, 22. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verse 28. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Notice verse 30. Because they said, the reason why the Lord just taught about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you is that in the Gospels, the Lord's statements about blaspheming against the Holy Ghost are given as a warning, not a declaration that they've already committed the sin. Now, you'll, you'll need to read the passages and decide for yourself whether that's true. I believe the sense of it is he's not saying, well, you guys went too far this time. You've committed it, and now that's it. I think it's more of a warning. Now, keep Mark 3, 
But get Matthew 12, verse 28. Matthew 12, verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So notice what the Lord is saying in Matthew 12, 28. How is it that the Lord Jesus Christ was able to cast out devils? And the answer, according to Matthew 12, 28, is he was able to do so by the capital S spirit of capital G God. Does anyone know who that might be? That's the Holy Ghost, right? Now, think about this with me just for a second. In Mark chapter 3, verse 30, what they say about the Lord is that he hath an unclean spirit. Matthew 12, 28 makes the point that Jesus Christ had the Spirit of God. Now, isn't that a slander against the Holy Ghost? I mean, Jesus Christ has the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Ghost, and they say, the spirit you have is an unclean spirit. Isn't that irreverent words uttered impiously against the Holy Spirit. It's clearly reproach. I mean, it's, it's slander. So how is that not blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? The answer, I believe, is Acts 1, verse 5. Get Acts 1, verse 5. Acts chapter 1. Verse 5. Acts 1 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, notice, not many days hence. So, does the baptism with the Holy Ghost occur in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? No. Does it occur in Acts chapter 1? No, because it's in the future from Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Well, where does baptism with the Holy Ghost occur? Look with me at Acts 2, 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, the receipt of the Holy Ghost was future in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was future in Acts chapter 1, and it's only received when someone fulfills the conditions of Acts 2, verse 38. So, let me pull this together here. If you were to look in the Scriptures for an instance of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, what would it look like? And I'm going to suggest to you it would have three characteristics. The first characteristic is it would have to be a sin against the Holy Ghost specifically and not just God. And we know that from the verses that say, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be. So blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, if we find it, it's going to have to be something that is directed specifically against the Holy Ghost. The second criteria is the sin would have to be unforgivable, right? Because when you read Mark 3.29, when you read Matthew 12, it clearly conveys the idea that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost can never be forgiven. And the third criteria is this. It would seem to have to be after the Holy Ghost is given in Acts 2, but before the completion of the transition to the dispensation of grace where the Holy Ghost operates differently. Let me just pause there. Does the Holy Ghost operate differently today during the dispensation of grace from what it did under the kingdom program? And the answer is, yes, it does. So get with me Hebrews 6.4. Let's think about this now for a bit. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4. 
And what I want to do is I want to show you some verses in Hebrews. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that under the kingdom gospel, unforgivable sins are said to be committed against the Holy Ghost. So read Hebrews 6 verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, notice, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. So those folks apparently were partakers of the Holy Ghost. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now let me pause for a minute on this verse. The doctrine of Arminianism teaches that someone can fall away from the faith and lose their salvation, but then they can regain it. And if they regain it, they can fall away again, and they can regain it again. Is that the way that salvation works during the dispensation of grace? The moment you believe the gospel today, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. It is impossible for a believer today to lose their salvation. Because the moment you believe the gospel, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. You're not saved by works, you're saved by faith. God counts your faith for righteousness the instant you believe the gospel. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, even if you renounce the faith, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. 1 Corinthians 3.15, Someone shows at the judgment seat of Christ, all their works are burned, and it specifically says that they will nonetheless be saved. My point is when you survey what the different Pauline verses say about eternal security, it's absolutely clear that someone that believes the gospel of grace during the dispensation of grace cannot lose their salvation. Therefore, the Arminian doctrine that you can fall away and lose your salvation and then get it back is completely and utterly wrong during the dispensation of grace. But now what I want you to notice is that the Arminian doctrine of falling away and regaining salvation is not true in the book of Hebrews. Because look at what it says, verse 4. For it is impossible, and I'm going to skip to verse 6 so you get the point, for it is impossible if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance. Under the kingdom program as described in Hebrews 6, if you've tasted of the good word of God and you've been made a partaker of the Holy Ghost and you fall away, what options do you have? None. It uses the word impossible. So now what I want you to notice is this. This in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 is an unforgivable sin and it's committed by people who the verse says were partakers of the Holy Ghost. Get with me Hebrews 10, 26. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. So the folks have received the knowledge of the truth and after that they sin willfully. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. That's an unforgivable sin, isn't it? After they receive the knowledge of the truth, they sinned willfully, and what do they have to look forward to? A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Verse 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, notice, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. 
what is Hebrews 10 talking about? This willful sin that cannot be forgiven, who is it committed against? The capital S Spirit of Grace. Anyone have a guess who that might be? It's the Holy Ghost. So what Hebrews 10 is talking about is that unforgivable sin is committed against the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10, verse 30, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So what did these verses in Hebrews tell us? What they tell us is that under the kingdom gospel, unforgivable sins are said to be committed against the Holy Spirit. So with that, let me remind you of what I think are the three conditions for what blasphemy against the Holy Ghost would look like. The first is, it would have to be a sin against the Holy Ghost specifically, not just God. The second, it would have to be unforgivable, unforgivable, because blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is unforgivable. And third, it would have to be after Acts 2 when the Holy Ghost is given, but it would have to be before the completion of the transition to the dispensation of grace when the Holy Spirit operates differently. So if we take all that, get Acts 5. Acts chapter 5. And what I'd like to consider with you is whether Ananias and Sapphira committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. Acts 5, 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Who did Ananias sin against in Acts chapter 5 verse 3? The Holy Ghost. Verse 4, Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. Ananias is immediately dead. Verse 6, And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Sapphira is immediately dead. And the verses tell us that Ananias and Sapphira tempted the Spirit of the Lord. Verse 10, Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Now I'll remind you, of what we looked at in Ezekiel 20, verse 27. You don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. Therefore, son of man, speak unto the house of Israel and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me, in that they have committed a trespass against me. A scriptural definition there, that when you commit a trespass against someone, it is blasphemy against that person. So now let me tie this together. Here's what we've seen. In Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Ghost. 
They are said to tempt the Spirit of the Lord. And when they do that, is there any forgiveness that is offered to them? There's no forgiveness that is offered to them. And the sin is apparently unforgivable, and it was committed against the Holy Ghost. Their earthly lives promptly ended. They were killed. This is the only example I know of in Scripture that fits the criteria for blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. It has to be a sin that's committed against the Holy Ghost, and it has to be one that is unforgivable. And that's what that seems to be. People have always wondered, why in Acts 5 is it so harsh? Right? Because they sell something that's theirs. They keep back part of the purchase price. Why is it immediate judgment? Right? There's a lot of sins in the Scripture where there's not immediate judgment. There's immediate judgment there. Why was there? I think there was because you know the sin that was committed? It was blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. There is no forgiveness for blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So what happened to them promptly upon that? They were killed, and there was no forgiveness that was authored, offered. So my, my belief, you can decide for yourself, search it out. I think Acts 5 is an instance of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Now here's the question people wonder, and this question people ask all the time. Can someone commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost during the dispensation of grace? And what people do is they think, well, you know, said a lot of swear words in the day, which people do. You probably know this. And do people take the Lord's name in vain? They do. They say things like that. And what happens if you took the Holy Spirit's name in vain? And so people have a lot of guilt. You know, did, did I do that? Well, I'm going to just simply say this. It's not possible to commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost today during the dispensation of grace. Here's why I say that. Number one, does Paul ever mention blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? He never speaks of it. If it was an unforgivable sin that you could commit and be eternally damned, wouldn't he warn you about that? I mean, in fact, that's what I would suggest to you that's what the Lord is doing in the Gospels. It, let me ask, let me make this point. What God does is He warns people before the problem is presented. He doesn't let it happen and then says, aha! He told Adam not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil beforehand. Yes. In Exodus 19, he explains to Moses the terms of the Old Covenant before it's dedicated in Exodus 24. He doesn't like wait for people to step in it and then say, I gotcha. That would be completely unjust. So what's going on in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is the Lord is warning about the future possibility of committing blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Because if someone could do that, it's the same as this. The reason why Scripture tells you in Revelation very clearly that the mark of the beast is unforgivable is it's fair warning. It's fair warning to the world if you find yourself on the earth during the 70th week, do not, under any circumstance, take the mark. It is better to be beheaded. It's better to be tortured. It's better to starve to death. Under no circumstance, take the mark of the beast. Revelation is fair warning about that. If you could commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost today, you would be given fair warning of it. But you're not because you can't. Now here's the second reason no one has committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost today. If you think you committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and you're still breathing, then you didn't. Right? What happened in Acts chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? When it was revealed to them that they had tempted the Spirit of the Lord, what happened? So if you didn't immediately die, 
then the sin you did, which probably wasn't good, it still wasn't blasphemy against the Holy Ghost because you're still here. Hopefully you see that. And then here's the third reason and the most fundamental reason. The Holy Ghost does not operate during the dispensation of grace the way it does under the kingdom program. So, for example, when we read in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 that someone w could commit a sin against the Holy Spirit and that it was impossible to renew them again unto repentance, there was nothing but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Is that how the Holy Spirit interacts with you today? Look with me at Ephesians 1 verse 13. Ephesians 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What happens when you believe is you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That's not you doing it. That's the Holy Spirit doing it. That's the Holy Spirit sealing you marking you, identifying you as belonging to God. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance. In other words, the Holy Spirit acting as a seal is a down payment. It is a good faith payment made as to future performance. It's not something where the Holy Spirit is going to be removed from you and judgment poured out upon you. Look at me at Ephesians 4, verse 30. Ephesians 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, notice that when the Holy Spirit seals you, that sealing continues, 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 and it lasts all the way up until the day of redemption. The day of redemption is what event? The rapture. So you are sealed from the moment that you believe all the way up to the rapture. Now, not only that, notice what the first part of verse 30 is saying when it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit's sealing of you, the Holy Spirit's indwelling in you, is so certain, it is so it is, it is just, you know, unchangeable until the day of redemption, that what actually happens is this. Under the kingdom program, when, when people sinned against the Holy Spirit, what happened is that they, they, they lost the Holy Spirit. They, they were no longer uh, blessed by it. In fact, they were judged. What you do during the dispensation of grace is this. The Holy Spirit never departs from you. So what, what truthfully happens is this, most of us irk the Holy Spirit constantly, right? Because what happens is the fundamental characteristic of the Holy Spirit is that it is holy. And the most common description of your thought, words, and deeds is not holy, right? So the Holy Spirit is inside it's the Holy Spirit trapped in a man's body. And the Holy Spirit is like, wow, this guy's a jerk. Now, the Holy Spirit loves you. The Holy Spirit is going to seal you. But is the Holy Spirit grieved? Is the Holy Spirit vexed at the way that the body of Christ lives? And the truthful answer to that is yes. Now, what that demonstrates is the Holy Spirit is operating during the dispensation of grace fundamentally in a different way than it did under the kingdom program, where when there are certain sins that you did that were unforgivable, which we don't have today, the Holy Spirit would withdraw from you, and, and what you were left with is just a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. So let me summarize and we'll conclude. We started with the issue of how do you define the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How do you do that? And, and the point was, you can look at the dictionary definition, you can look at the scriptural definition, and what we saw is that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit 
certainly includes words spoken against the Holy Spirit, but it also includes sins committed against the Holy Spirit. We then consider, did Paul blaspheme the Holy Ghost? And Paul didn't because blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is unforgivable, but Paul obtained forgiveness. And Ananias, who knew everything that Paul had done, said to him, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. So Ananias didn't believe that Paul had committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. We then looked at the, what's commonly thought that Israel committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. But Israel didn't commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost because Stephen, who was full of the Holy Ghost, prayed for Israel to be forgiven, which 1 John 5, 16 says not to do if it's a sin unto death. So did Israel blaspheme the Holy Ghost? I don't think so. So when we actually did the analysis of what blasphemy against the Holy Ghost looks like, it has to be committed against the Holy Ghost. It has to be unforgivable. And it seems it has to occur after Acts 2 and before the full transition to the dispensation of grace. Who is the prime candidate, candidates, to have committed blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? It's Ananias and Sapphira who sinned directly against the Holy Ghost. And when they did that, did the Holy Spirit treat it like it was an unforgivable sin? Yeah, because they were promptly killed. They were never offered forgiveness. And we'll close with this. Can you commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost today? You can't, because the Holy Ghost is not operating that way today. So hopefully that gives you some peace of mind about that question.